this morning I have the responsibility to share with us uh, on unpacking old baggage. It is, it is very tempting, especially when you know that you have much baggage and you are asked to uh, help people unpack their own. So this morning, it's, it's good that I'm very far off from you, but I know I'll be sweating a lot as I say some of the things that my conscience will be telling me that is you. So most of the things I share is my life. I hope that they don't reach you in a, a personal mode. <laughs> and so I would, I know we are not used up, but I would request that we be upstanding for the reading of the word. And I have two passages I want us to read this morning. I want us to look at uh, Isaiah chapter 30, verse 20 and 21. And then I would also look at 2 Timothy 1 and 5. And I will read. And though the Lord gives you the bread of adversity and the water of affliction, yet your teachers will not be moved into a corner anymore. But your eyes shall see your teachers, your ears shall hear a word behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. Whenever you turn to the right hand, or whenever you turn to the left, or whenever you turn to the left. Then we move to 2 Timothy. Second Timothy 1 Timothy 1.5. And it says, When I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you, which dwelled first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I'm persuaded is in you also. Other versions use the word, and when I call to remembrance the sincere faith. And so I would prefer, when I get to that, I would use sincere, not just genuine, but I would use sincere. Could you be seated, please? Since uh, Reverend Buire prayed for us, we would... Pick it up from here. Now, what is meant by the word baggage? And generally, we all know it refers to suitcases, trunks, and personal belongings of travelers. It is basically a luggage. It is also transportable equipment, and this, in this case, especially for military force. Number three, it is intangible things, such as feelings, circumstances, or beliefs that get in the way of our lives emotionally. And it's it is interesting to note what it, what it does mean to have baggage. Baggage is an emotional turmoil caused by some issue in someone's life past. And I want to inform us that nearly every one of us comes with it in relationships. And I told you I'm the chief one in this. It is a part of life, not really a good one that you should not accommodate for long. Uh, while some of us arrived in families and marriages via the altar, we may have come in nice suits, and ladies may have come with a white dress, but one sure thing that the officiating minister did not see is your little bag or a container of the baggage you came with. 
Some of us arrive with smaller bags of baggage, and some of us come with a real container of baggages. Some of us who come lighter, it is easier to handle us, but some of us who come with containers, imagine a friend visiting with a whole container of things. You know this one will not leave very soon. <laughs> Catherine Silva, a, psych a psychotherapist, says, while pretty much all baggage can be overcome, given the right set of circumstances, if you or your partner is un unable or unwilling to recognize and acknowledge what kind of baggage or self-defeating tendencies you bring to the relationship. Your relationship almost certainly won't last if that is the case. You have to be willing to own up to your own baggage in order to have a shot at overcoming it. And just like you may have realized that I'm in the process of overcoming mine because I, I acknowledge it. And so I invite you to join my team because the best way to deal with this is not to behave. And I'm speaking to a church community where there is a lot of insincerity when it comes to baggages, where there is a lot of acting, a lot of putting forth the best foot for people Yet we know inside there we are loaded and we might not unpack all very soon. When we tamper with the growing of maize and sugar, we don't have to ask what happens to the millers. And since we have a shortage of maize in Kenya today, even as they try to encourage us to eat other foods, we are used to this one, and we still feel that Kenya has a shortage of food, especially my Western friends. Family is the integral part that forms a community. And sick families would form a sick community and a sick society. And ultimately, a sick nation. So as our politicians try to fix it up there, we are gathered here in the presence of God and ourselves to fix it where it really matters. And that is family. There are three types of baggages that I would just mention in passing, and one is emotional baggage. It is normal to everyone that we are emotions, if we have emotions, if you are a true human being, I hope you have emotion. Touch your neighbor and find out if they have. You know, when we talk of emotions, I have noticed one emotion that has managed to go through both my maternal and paternal lineage to me. Both of those families are badly known of temper, bad temper. And so, I don't know how, but it has, it has some atoms on me most of the time. I am very good up here, but when we come down there to live, I can easily lose my temper. And my wife has endured this. Until the Lord gave me something I call my last born daughter. If this girl didn't look like me, I think I would have disowned her. So the, the dad walks in with this inherent problem and he wants to shout at everybody. And she says, come on dad, relax. 
I think I have good brains to understand if you just talk to me. Something the mother never does, the elder sister has never done, the brother never does, they always bow down when the lion barks. But here is a little girl coming very late. It should have been just in order for her to comply. And she tells me, no, dad, I prefer when you talk to me. What a generation. I'm glad I, hope I only have one of that kind. If I had two, I would have killed somebody's wife because they would not transit well to get to their husbands. So emotional baggage, every one of us have them. These are unresolved emotional turmoils from the past to the new relationships, sometimes they have got an overnight baggage. Some of us come with very little bags. And, and, and I wish, I always pray that in my social interactions, I just meet people who have the smaller bag, bags. But amazingly, the Lord has distributed them, if it is the Lord, that we also have those who have come with containers. And most of the time, you will meet the most loaded ones. Number two, we have mental baggage. The feelings you have about your past and the things that have happened to you. And each one of us who has a past, there are things that happened to you, good and bad. And they all sometimes make your mental baggage. And then there is the historical baggage. This refers to feelings and particularly beliefs and problems or past events in your life and they can make life very, very difficult. Some of our difficult childhood leaves us with a heavy load of personal and emotional baggage the cultural, political, historical baggages of our region can also weigh down on us. And some of us, the way we behave is not just what we have gone through, it is where we come from. When I was growing up, the elders in my village had a problem people marrying from a certain group of people. I eventually ended up marrying there. Hope they would not cast me from the graves. But they would not accept because they had a perception. And some of these things are transferred to us. And they become baggages that we even don't understand how they function. But yes, we have them. Have you had something in your bag traveling that you didn't know how it works? And this is how we carry along the historical baggages. And I've already said, we arrive in different styles. Some of us amazingly smartly dressed for us to get into family life. Some of us may have come into family life uh, in different ways. But the fact remains, as we are seated here, we might be, a, we are husband and wife and children in some kind of a family. There is a fallacy that has been spoken always in church. And we emphasize, and it's very good, we emphasize the marry in the will of God. Find somebody who is the will of God for you. Having said that, all good Christians, it is not a guarantee that marrying in the will of God would give you a successful marriage and a good family. It doesn't just work. And all of us are witnesses because you knew, and some of us, the Lord was gracious. We may have seen a vision of who to marry, but yet reality is teaching you that that vision was true, but reality on the ground is different. We have testimonies. Yes, I prayed and the Lord gave me. What the Lord gave me has 
come with baggages also. So just because we are marrying in the will of God does not guarantee that we will be succeeding. And I want to use a passage in scripture just to help us uh, unpack that. And that is Genesis 27. I will just mention a few things. And this is a family. The husband is called Isaac. And the wife is called Rebecca. And they are blessed with two sons. One is called Esau and the other one is called Jacob. And as verse, uh, chapter 27 opens up, we see a very interesting face of the life of these people. If you read them before, they begin life on a highly spiritual platform. Rebecca loves Isaac even without seeing, seeing him. And Isaac is very expectant of this uh, delicate that went to look for a wife for them, for him. And from very far off, when Rebecca sees Isaac, she, she goes down and bows. And from there, there is this beautiful marriage. Even when children are a challenge, they trust God together. And the Lord grants them pregnancy. And the Bible says, as the children were growing in the, in the womb of Rebekah, they struggled, they fought, and hence a prophetic word was given to this family. Now we find them in chapter 27 of Genesis. The boys are grown, inclined to particular practices and personalities, and seemingly in that family, lines and favorites have been chosen. You don't read very far from verse 1 and you realize that Isaac is growing old and he cannot see very well. He has a poor eyesight, probably blind and not able to see. And that sets the stage for the drama that follows. He knows, and everybody of us who is older knows, that when you grow old, you begin to think of how you want to live the little things you have and to whom. And so Isaac tells Esau, my son, and again, not as you will read for yourself, that each one of them refers to a particular child as my son. There is that possessiveness. So, for Isaac, my son refers to Esau. And he says, my son, would you take your equipment and go do me, and, and go hunt and bring me some game and prepare it just the way I know, I mean, I like it. You know, when families begin to speak like this, there is a problem. When my sons and daughters are the ones who prepare the meat and the soup I like. Hello. When it is not my wife, it is my son or daughter. By the way, I am a victim. I told you, please don't take this personal because my son is doing hospitality and he cooks very nice. So I have a temptation also of ask, asking him, Jeremy, would you prepare this for me? And I don't know how the mother feels, but that is a talk for another day. So Isaac tells Esau, prepare this meal the way I like. And as this conversation is going on, there is an expected guest somewhere and he's is dropping on them and that is Rebecca. When families, when husbands and wives begin to behave like this, you can be sure something is wrong. 
Hello? Maybe it's just me. I could be reading too much in that passage. And then Rebecca tells, calls the son and says, my son, and that is Jacob. You may have realized that uh, Isaac's favorite is Esau and Rebecca's favorite is who? Oh, you can't say it because you can't confess your sins like that. <laughs> Hallelujah. We realize that each of these parents has a favorite. And we cannot deny it that this is a sin committed in families today and it makes a part of the baggages that these children carry to their families. And so Rebecca says, my son, and for her when she says my son, she means Jacob. I have overheard your father. And it doesn't even sound nicely. If a wife would make a, such a statement to a son. He says, I have overheard your father speaking to your brother. And so, to cut the story short, she tells him, go to the herd and get me two small gods and I'll prepare them the way your father likes them. So it's not just the son who knows how to prepare, but also the wife knows how to prepare. And when you have two cooks competing for your attention, you are in trouble. And Jacob has some concerns and say, Mom, I am just the opposite of my brother. What if my father discovers this? And here, what the beautiful wife, if in our setting she could have walked to the aisle, to the altar in white. Listen to what she says. If she discovers and and she, he feels like cursing you, let that fall on me. When wives take the risk of going that far, then a lot of garbage is being, baggage is being formed. A lot of it. This one is not for traveling bags. This one is for containers now. And she tells the son, I have thought through my son, if a curse is involved, let it be, but I take responsibility. And just a summary of this couple, to show you that as much as they trusted God for that marriage, there were enough of those baggages. Rebecca manifests a very manipulative spirit. She must have grown in an environment that told her, that taught her, that trained her to gamble, to get things from people even when they don't like it. Ha, 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 hello, our husbands in the house. Do you have a sister who can get anything from you, whether you like it or not? And every weapon at our disposal would be employed. And this is Rebecca, very manipulative, very bossy, controlling. And you see, she has a very spiritual reason why she's doing this. She knows when God gave her the pregnancy, there was a prophetic word that the younger would rule over the older. And so she's using this prophetic word to manipulate the husband. And I, I have a warning for my brothers in the house that we have a deficiency for the male figure in worship services. And when the spirit of the Lord moves, all that is heavily present is the female gender. 
and they hear God very well. And when they come home and you cannot read verses very clearly, she even knows the deeper meaning of these verses. When you can, when you come home and you are tired and the best construction of praise the Lord is praise the God, she knows what should be done in this family. She has had God and she is not ready and she is not about to seed ground for any word of that prophetic utterance, whether a man stands in her way or not. Now you understand Rebecca. She is not just manipulating. She has a prophetic word to protect. But how? How, sisters? Just because God has spoken does not allow you tampering with his laid down procedures of authority. Where we have brothers who are blind and they cannot see any spiritual thing for their family. Who talk politics more and money most. But yet they cannot figure out what God is doing. But you have a wife who has tugged her ear in the heart of God and she can clearly state the heartbeat of that heart. It is very tempting to move from that situation and yet find the so-called head that cannot think. So Rebecca resorts for Craftiness, cunningness. But look at Isaac. She has a poor eyesight. She cannot see the obvious. I mean, he cannot see the obvious. And I am sorry, I might be putting too much of baggage on him. But I think he's greedy. When, when your stories and the main, the main things of your life Rotate around food, my brother. But I also feel Isaac is not just greedy, but very secretive. He has been told by the grandfather that women are devils and don't, don't tell them anything of your life. But how did they come into... This family and relationship, highly spiritual, sought God every step. Even somebody was asked to take an oath that he will not do anything that is contrary to the will of God. And I mean, I mean, the servant of Abraham has to vow that he will bring the right person for Isaac. That said... We have a testimony of terrible, ugly baggages in this family. As Rebecca pursues spiritual things, Isaac pursues cultural things. My culture has never taught me to cook. That is a woman's work. Even if tea was being boiled on this cooker, and you are there, you'd rather have it of a boil as you run to tell the wife the tea, the, the tea is ready. You know, my wife has a problem because we were born four boys and my mother is a, a dictator. She, she, she doesn't take nonsense. And so it was simple. If it's your duty to collect firewood, you have to. If it's your duty to bring water, you have to. If it's your duty to cook, you have to cook. So I can always look at the, the ugali and before I touch it, I know if it's cooked or not. So Isaac is fostering a culture here. The culture says, 
Who should get the inheritance first? The last, the firstborn. But Rebecca is looking at the word of the Lord. The elder shall serve the younger. When our families struggled on the struggles on the line of culture and spirituality, this is a, a very dangerous thing. And senior said last Sunday, one of the signs that you are your spiritual capital is deficient is when you become a liar and corrupt. What do we see in this passage in 27? There is a lot of corruption. There is a lot of lying. So how do we fix these things now that they are with us? Now that you are aware that you have your Lord here with you. Looking at the eyes of everybody, it is not if. You have. Each one of us, even the preacher, I've already confided in you that I have my own. And you have to identify them, acknowledge them, before any effort of dealing with them takes place. Signs of this baggage is serial cheating, trust issues, and required crashes. You, you know, there, there are husbands who just feel and wives who just feel, I wish I had married so and so. And they are already married. Another sign of knowing that the baggage is present is avoidance of conflict. There are people when there are issues to discuss, but they will never sit down. They would find every reason to go around it. That is a problem. Intense past relationships. Each one of us who had a past relationship, whether family or social, whatever, we have baggages in there. They show up. Serious insecurity issues. Who is that? Who has called? Where were you? They could be concerns, legitimate, but there are levels where they cross the line and become signs of insecurity. And that is a baggage to unpack. Fear of commitment and the likes. Now, how do we sort out this problem? For Greeks, they had a better way of dealing. You, you, you see, all these are recipes of love. If we want to solve the problems we have, the baggage we carry, it all boils down to what God has commanded families to do. And that is Ephesians 5.21. And before we look at Ephesians 5.21, the, the magic word in families and marriages should be the little word, four-letter word, love. If you find somebody who has insecurity issues, you can trace them to issues of love in the family where they grow up in. If you have people who cannot get enough affirmation, the issues of love. So how do we solve it? In, in the Greek, we, we use a language that is very poor in vocabulary. So that when I say, I love you, I have to clarify. Church, if I just said, I love you so much, the ladies in this meeting would be, what did he mean? And even the brothers, if I overemphasize, they would be saying, ah, I just want to be sure that pastor is not from the other group. <laughs> but for Greeks, this was very simple. 
When they said love for God, they had a word. When they said love for friends, there was a word. And when they said love for parents and children, there was a word. And when they said love as a sexual relationship, there was a word. They didn't have to explain themselves like us. We say, I love you with the love of God. It's just a way of explaining it so that you do not misunderstand me. You don't accuse me for what I didn't intend to say. So, in Ephesians, Paul says, and I want to read this, there, there is a heated argument on the issue of submission. Are the sisters in the house? Submission is a very ugly word for you. And you would pay me later because I would give you a better one. So that you learn to submit. Paul writes and talks to the Ephesians and says, out of respect, and I'm reading from the message Bible, message version, out of respect for Christ, be courteously reverent to one another. And it is the same verse that says, submit ye one to another. So the word that has been used here is respect. So Paul says, respect you one another. So if a woman is told to submit, in essence, he's being told, respect your husband. Is there any problem our sisters respecting? No, but they have a problem submitting. And so... I do not know why Paul begins by instructing the woman. And he says, wives, and listen to this version. Says, wives, understand and support your husbands in ways that show your support for Christ. If we want to deal with these baggages, then women or our wives have to learn to understand and support their husbands in ways that show what? Respect for Christ. That is what other versions say, submit. And so for me, God is tell, uh, Paul is telling women that if you want to deal with baggages that could grow out of your family, generate friendship love in your family. The friends I enjoy today, I knew them through my wife. She gets a friend, and then she drags me to the husband of that friend. And we get to know one another, and now we are very good friends. And I, I, I boast of a friend, but it began with my wife. Women, they are good at making friends. And this is what we are saying. To grow healthy families, it requires a woman who is able to pour the love that would generate friendly love there. What we have as Pileo. And then he moves to the husband and says, husbands, love your wives. And the word he uses for love is not phileo, it is not storage for family, and it's not a rose for sexual. It is the word agape. So the husband has the responsibility to do what? To generate the love of God at home. The wife generates friendship. The husband generates the love of God. And that two mixed together, we have what we call storage that now is used in loving children in that family. A mixture of the love of God and a mixture of friendliness becomes the recipe for feeding children. As they grow in the love of the father and the mother, which has their source in God and friendliness, they are able to reduce the levels of baggages. 
And Paul says, children, obey your parents. Because if they miss those two loves, they will begin to practice the fourth one, eros. So they are told, if you feed on storage as parental love, you are good to go. You can identify what is good for you and what is not good for you. You can reduce the package. You can reduce your container. You can throw out some stuff that is not necessary for you. But for you also to stay in that love, you must obey. Obey is simply staying in the words that have been spoken to you. And we have a generation that thinks that they know more than dad and mom. Of course they know more. My, my youngest daughter knows more when it comes to speaking. She knows the right tone and the right, she, she can regulate it and say, dad, it is here. Not here. When this is well done and properly done, then we are able to see what we have seen in First Timothy one, Second Timothy one five. Paul says, "I know the love that I mean the sincere faith that was in your grandmother, and it was also in your mother." And I'm convinced it is in you. The word sincere in, Lat in Latin is called sincero, meaning no works applied. And in those days, if you wanted to sell gen uh, something genuine, you would tag it with a tag. Just like you go to butter and you have some shoes with genuine leather. So for a genuine item, in a Latin workshop, it would have a tag sin zero, meaning no work supplied. If a carpenter worked on wood and he discovered that there is a hole in that uh, piece of wood, he could mix glue and sawdust and fill it and sandpaper it very well and apply varnish. You would never know there is a hole there. But for a merchant who wants to buy this in the Latin community will take this wood or pot to the sun and take his time to wait. So when the sun gets hot, the wax begin to melt. And he knows that this is not a genuine pot and this is not a genuine piece of wood. And so for us, the Lord has sent his son to test our genuineness, our sincerity. And when the light of God hits us, also when the heat of challenges of life and trials hit on us, those gaps that we hide under smart dressing begins to surface. And the merchants feel cheated. The husband feels cheated. The wife feels cheated. The children feel robbed. Our father does not have a sincere faith. What he says in church is not what he does home. Our mother is not a true Christian because what he tells us to do herself she cannot manage. There is a lot of works applied. We are not sincere. To deal with this, we require a sincere faith that will be transmitted to the next generation. And God tells us, and the Lord knows this will not be easy. So he says, though I give you the bread of adversity and the waters of affliction, yet thou shall not miss the voice of your teachers behind you. They would always tell you, even when you are on your end and when you, your back is on the wall, there is always a voice that will tell you, this is the way. Family lives can be better, friends, if we learn to be genuine, if we learn to be sincere, if we learn to remove the works. And if we don't remove the works, the Lord would send the Son, either his glory 
or the tribulation and the gaps would show up, the cracks would show up. May the Lord help us. Amen.